Thanks, Jeanette. So Jeanette's already given me a way that I am both very interested in wildlife and outdoor recreation. Um, and I think a pretty topical subject in Squamish and Whistler and Pemberton and basically through this, this whole region that we live in and play in. So uh, in my bio there, Jeanette mentioned R and statistical analyses. I'm not going to get to any of that tonight, for better or worse. But what I do want to share with you is uh, the start of a project, sort of the evolution of a project, but also what we know about wildlife and recreation in the Sea to Sky Corridor right now and why I might be wanting to spend some more of my academic time thinking about these things rather than just going out and playing among them. So outdoor recreation in the sea to sky, I imagine many of us in the room do things on this list here on your left, but also maybe things that aren't on here. I just pulled this off of the Squamish website. Uh, the things in blue involve water here. So we've got kiteboarding, boating, stand-up paddleboarding, whitewater rafting, fly fishing. Uh, the things in orange involve helicopters. So people go heli-caving, uh, heli-hiking, heli-picnicking, heli-mountain biking. So we've got lots of motorized helicopter activity. Uh, but then we also have other motorized activities, so ATV tours, um, cat skiing, snowmobiling. I have sightseeing colored along with other motorized activity here because that tends to involve driving around to these wonderful places so we can have these lovely views. Uh, but then we also have backcountry skiing and snowboarding. We've got mountain biking. We've got lots of hiking, backpacking, uh, many different ways to get out and enjoy this wonderful landscape that we have. And then many people do this with a dog. And so I add dog here because dog is not recreation per se, but certainly a lot of us recreate with dogs in tow um, or maybe ahead of us on the trails. And so we are very much in the outdoor recreation capital of Canada, and many people have been catching on to this wonderful place. So this, these are graphs that actually I pulled from the Resort Municipality of Whistler's website. Uh, and so I'm not very good at these. Oh, yeah, okay. So Whistler is in blue over here, and then we've got Pemberton in orange. Uh, we have Squamish in red, and then the total for these three municipalities at the top of the line here. Going from 2000 to 2017, we see increases across the board, and if we look at the total, about a 25% increase in the population. So here on the right, we have from 2001, projecting forward what might happen with population size here in the Sea to Sky Corridor, and we see people are expecting a whole lot more individuals to move to these areas. So again, over here, we've got Pemberton in purple on the bottom, Whistler in green, Squamish in red, and then the total blue in the top. So we've got a lot of people who like to live here, and it's pretty easy to see why we might like to live here. Not only do we have locals and people who stay here year-round, we also attract a lot of tourists throughout the year. So tourism is the top economic resource through the Sea to Sky Corridor, and this involves tourism from other BC residents as well. So coming from anywhere in the Lower Mainland, coming from other parts of BC, coming to enjoy this wonderful outdoors we have here, um, and to do some adventure tourism. So we have 181 adventure tourism tenures. I'm not sure how up to date this is because the number is increasing and certainly the number of applications are increasing. Uh, and so that covers 
more than 100% of our land base because those tenures overlap. And so there's a, a lot of different tenure applications that can be happening on the same part of the landscape. But when we look at Destination BC, we find 59% of our visitors to the whole South Coast region, not just Whistler, Squamish, Pemberton, are motivated by wildlife and sightseeing opportunities. And so having these adventure tourism options also gets added on to the kinds of activities people do when they come here. 48% are motivated by hiking. And again, just pulling from local websites, 3 million visitors to Whistler per year. So that's a lot of people coming to this region and, and certainly seems to be being drawn by our natural wonderful outdoors. These are broad sort of statistics and numbers, but I really like this one here on the bottom coming from the Western Canada Mountain Biking Association. So they, they say in 2016, 398,000 mountain bikers that were non-residents, so not the people who live here to mountain bike year round, uh, had 1.2 million rides. And so the apps that we use to track uh, where the trails go and to track where we've been riding and how much elevation we've had provides some really wonderful data about how people are using our landscape here. So that's compared to 2006 where there were 210,000 rides. And so in 10 years, we've gone up a million rides by non-resident mountain bikers. That's pretty staggering. And that's just one statistic and sort of a smattering of what we can pull to be able to justify the fact that outdoor recreation is increasing in the Sea to Sky Corridor. We can also look at traffic counters and just look at the traffic volumes moving across our four service roads. So these roads provide access into backcountry for sightseeing, mountain biking, hiking, camping, any of these things that we like to do. And I pulled this actually from the chief. So a lot of the information in these first few slides are coming from our local newspapers. So this is the conversation that's been kind of being carried by the peak, by the chief, um, and in some cases by CBC articles as well. And so this one is looking at, if you look at the orange, we see a marked increase in the amount of traffic volume on Squamish Valley Forest Service Road. And this is going from 2012 on the left to 2018 on the right. So we're going from about 50,000 hits on a traffic counter on the road up to more than 100,000, so more than doubled. Now take it, this is a traffic counter that might be catching vehicles going in and out, so maybe we half that number for the total number of vehicles, but we'd also expect more than one person for vehicle, per vehicle going out there. So we can start to use this to infer how many people are using this area. And so in the chief, uh, information about uh, the forced uh, Flynn Road folks trying to figure out, hey, who's using this and how are you using it? They had a survey open asking for some public input on what's happening out there. And if you ever talk to Alistair McCrone, who is the recreational manager for the Sea to Sky Corridor, he likes to talk about poo. And here he says, there are piles of poo and disturbed cultural sites in the Squamish Valley. Because there's not a lot of camping resource out there, because there's not a lot of built infrastructure to support recreation, we end up having damage to our landscapes, evidence of camping in the bush without facilities, and as Alistair sells, piles of poo in the woods that now he has to try to deal with. A metric that he likes to use for increase in uh, abundance of recreational users in the region is also how many times he has to clean out the outhouses. It's a really great way to be able to determine how many people are visiting these places. And so we have a lot of data to be able to, to figure out what's happening with people in the backcountry. And I can't have to talk about this without talking about Joffrey Lakes. So there, the trails into Joffrey Lakes were improved around 2012. Also, people have been saying social media and posting of be beautiful photos from, from Joffrey Lakes is also catching on and working really well to attract people to these wonderful places. But we see that we've had an increase from around 20,000 visitors in 2014 up to more, almost 180,000 in 2017. And for those who maybe don't know where Joffrey Lakes is, we've got Squamish, 
Whistler, Pemberton, continue on up the highway, and we get to Joffrey Lakes there where that star is. Beautiful, beautiful place, uh, but certainly overrun by people. And so again, the conversation going on in our local community newspapers is about this major problem. And one of the major issues is that they're not built to support the amount of foot traffic or vehicle traffic that these numbers of people come with. And so there's been major issues with the highway up there, safety issues, um, infractions with people parking in places that they can't or should not be parking, so dangerously on the side of a busy highway. To enforce it, you can't tow them because then people would be stuck in a place with no cell phone coverage and no ability to get out of it. And so that causes another problem. So BC Parks has been working with other folks and is on the issue. Um, the latest I've heard that there's no clear management plan, but they are absolutely working very diligently to be able to develop something. And I understand that they're also working to understand visitor use. And so trying to get a handle on who is coming, when are they coming, how many people are coming, so that we can start to manage or they can start to manage this kind of an issue. Going forward, so why might this cause concern for wildlife? Because I'm not studying the social dynamics of people, I'm interested in the interaction between wildlife and these outdoor recreation and, and human use aspects. So the article on the left, most dangerous situation I've ever seen, uh, this was uh, referring to black bears out around Keyhole Hot Springs, which is out, if you go out the uh, Little Valley there, out through the Pemberton Meadows, um, beautiful, beautiful hot springs, but there is, again, unregulated camping out there. It led to habituated bears, and it led to it being closed down to avoid potentially the most dangerous situation ever and, and a massive and unfortunate interaction between humans and black bears. More locally, last fall, uh, the Sprout Alpine Lakes Rainbow Lake trail system also got closed down in September after three different interactions with grizzly bears and recreational users. And so in the, that time of the year, grizzly bears are getting fat to be able to go and hibernate, to be able to make it through the winter, and so it's a really critical time for them. And then we also have so many users out in this landscape that it was a dangerous situation, and so it, it had to get shut down. And so these are management practices to try to mitigate this issue, but it would be nice to actually have more, more foresight and insight into what's happening with wildlife, where are the humans going, and how might we project or estimate where the risks might be so maybe we can manage in advance instead of having to manage sort of on the fly as we have to shut things down after encounters. So human-wildlife conflict occurs whenever uh, humans or wildlife are negatively affected by each other. So for humans, we talk about risk of encounter, right? Encountering a grizzly bear is maybe not the most comfortable situation for many of us. Versus for wildlife, we're talking about disturbance or attraction. And depending on which wildlife we're talking about, it could be more about disturbance or more about attraction. And because wildlife can detect us, or maybe we can detect them, more than when we're just standing in front of each other, through sight or sound or scent, a lot of this encounter can happen actually if we never see the wildlife. And so we can be disturbing wildlife we don't even know is there, and it can be continued to be a disturbance after we've moved out of the area, if that animal is still responding to what was our presence previously. So these are the things I'm interested in thinking about. And plenty of people have thought about this before I have. And so ecology is a study of the distribution and abundance of animals. And recreation ecology is a subfield of that that looks in particular at the impacts of recreation on wildlife and ecological values. And so after World War II in the US, there was increasing uh, recreational users, more free time, maybe more free money, more available money, right? Dispendable income. And at the same time that people were getting out and enjoying the outdoors more, a conservation ethic arose. And they sort of paralleled each other. But what we realize now is that actually maybe they're not sort of going hand in hand, and maybe they're actually now working in opposition with each other as the number of users in the recreational sense grows. 
There was a lot of work in recreational ecology in the US around the 70s and 90s because that's when they were dealing with this big increase in numbers in recreational users and when they were seeing problems in their park systems that required more proactive management. So we've got all of that literature available to try to inform what maybe is going on here. Um, and then ecology itself. We know a lot about the behavior of animals. We know about how they sort of balance energy, energy out versus those critical foraging periods of their life when they're bringing energy in. Uh, and then we also know a lot about predator-prey dynamics. So what I've set up to do here is try to figure out what do we already know about our area, what do we already know about the science, and then maybe how can we bring these together to be able to get the information we need to proactively manage an issue about humans and wildlife in our outdoor areas. So a bit of a diagram here I'll walk us through, just a summary of kind of how all of these things might connect. So on the top we have causes of an impact to, to wildlife. And so recreational activities, harvest is included here, so hunting, um, habitat modification, if we're putting in trails, if we're expanding trail networks, if we're building roads to get to trails. Uh, pollution, so anything that ends up going into our waterways or spills on our land as we're out maybe off-roading in the back country. Uh, and then disturbance. So this can be either just our presence or it can be uh, our, the noise that we create or light that we create. So many different things can, can qualify as disturbance. And so immediate response, certainly if we're talking about harvest, would be death. Bad. So we, we can start actually measuring full direct impacts through death. But what's interesting and maybe more challenging is trying to actually figure out what the behavioral change might be. And so immediate response is if we come across a deer, maybe we flush it and we see it run away. So that's an immediate response. The question then becomes, what about long-term effects? Does that deer just carry on as if nothing ever happened? It kind of moves back once we move, move off the trail and then gets back to whatever it was doing with no consequence, or is there maybe more that we need to think about? So there's this altered behavior, and this could be uh, anything, again, from maybe going and eating somewhere else, or maybe deciding not to walk on the trails because so many people are walking along trails. So altering their behavior. It could be because they choose to avoid places we are, they're not eating the really good food, the really good forage, and so that can actually reduce how much fat animals are able to put on at particular times of the year. Altered productivity, if they're not eating the good food and their body condition is not as good, then perhaps that can alter their reproductive success. Again, depending on the time of year and when the disturbance is happening. And then, of course, there's also potential for death. Uh, and so uh, changes in behavior that maybe lead to more risky behavior around predators could, again, increase potential for mortality. So that's individuals, which is certainly something that can be happening on our trail systems. The question is whether that actually scales up to populations. Are there enough individuals affected that we might end up getting reduced population abundance? Or are animals avoiding trail systems to the extent that our populations are distributing themselves in places that are new or avoiding places they've always been because there are so many recreational users on the landscape. And then the demographics speaks to whether males and females are responding the same way or whether adults and young are responding the same way. And so do we start to see some shifts in the demographics of our populations as a result of changes or impacts from recreational users? And then if we're affecting species, we can be affecting the mix of species and uh, communities and in particular, if our prey, things like deer, are attracted to human trails, well, things like uh, wolves or other kind of carnivores or predators avoid human presence, we can be changing the predator-prey interaction because prey are getting sort of a predator refuge around where more people are. And so we do see some of that kind of evidence in Banff. Uh, and these places where we, we have had issues with ungulates, deer-like things, elk and deer, having huge populations in the town of Banff, and the wolves so more or less staying out of the town. There is an example where the wolves came into town. 
However, we'll leave that one for now. So specific to carnivores, we do know that there are some of these behavioral effects. And so bears rest in more dense vegetation as humid, human activity increases. And so where they're spending their time changes if it's busier. We also know that overnight camping displaced grizzly bears that were within 200 meters of the campground. We know that grizzly bears detect humans further away and are disturbed by humans at much larger distances than 200 meters, but this was specifically in relation to a particular campground in the US. Brown bears increase nocturnal behavior after encounters, and so they changed the time of day that they were active, and this lasted for several days after an encounter with humans. Wolves, so reproduction is a really important thing for animals and more of a sensitive period, and so they actually den and have their rendezvous sites where they meet up with their young further from villages and roads. And so we can see sort of this displacement. And then cougars, again, because reproduction is a really important time, they avoid human disturbances by four times the distance during reproductive periods than what they do when they're just moving or feeding. And so we see some the spatial distribution that shifts depending on the time of year and the species that we're talking about. And we know that goats don't like helicopters. So they like to stand on top of these mountains. Helicopters flying in the mountains can cause quite a bit of disturbance. And this kind of disturbance can lead to increased vigilance. So where a goat is you know, foraging or, or looking for food, it instead is looking up and sort of paying attention to this helicopter above it. And so it's time lost to foraging. Alternatively, if they have to move because they feel so disturbed, it's actually now energy getting used instead of foraging where energy would be coming in. And so these are the balances that end up being important for what the impacts might be to these kinds of species. So to shift a little bit, instead of just the outcomes of this research, how we might go about to doing, doing some of this, this is an example where we have a trail and a mountain biker and we had a person observing where this deer moved as the mountain biker came down the trail. And so what they saw was that when the mountain biker was here, the deer showed evidence that it was alert. So it sort of lifted its head and, and was aware that the mountain biker was there. By the time the biker hit this location, the deer moved from this position over to here. And so depending on how far that deer is from the trail, we would expect the response to be slightly different. Ultimately, mule deer have a 70% probability of flushing or running away if they are within 390 meters or less of a trail. And so we can start putting distances and numbers down to when we expect animals to detect our presence and run away. It's not quite the same when we go to Banff or Jasper in the Rockies. And so mule deer in Banff already seem almost domesticated and don't seem to be so concerned about the humans around town because they are also in town. So we have species specific responses, but we also have regional specific responses. So while all of this work that's been done before can inform what's happening here in the sea to sky, we still need to understand what's happening in our particular case. But also, we only see the animals that don't flush. And so our personal experience or what we see when we're out in the wilderness ourselves doesn't really inform what's happening with wildlife. So we can say, oh, the grizzlies don't mind us. We just had all these encounters over in Rainbow Lake. But that doesn't tell us what's happening with all the ones that are actually being disturbed by us that we don't see. And so it's important that we have some more standardized methods to be able to capture what's happening. So I talked about how that deer can move based off spatial distribution of the mountain biker and where the deer is. But we can also look at the time between when an animal is on a trail or in a particular location and when a predator, in this case a dog, also comes out so that we can look at the time between detections of a prey and its predator. And then we can also determine how long after a predator is present does a prey come back out. So we can start explicitly looking at interactions on the landscape through time. And then we can compare 
the time between two prey detections, when there was a predator and when there wasn't. And this is what allows us to start to look for behavioral alterations as a result of humans, if we put ourselves in the place of that predator, or in this case, an off-leash dog, in the place of that predator and start comparing that to what happens in a natural system when we actually have predators also in, the, in, in our data. And so white-tailed deer avoid dogs and humans in time, but not so much in space in other, in other studies. And so this is again sort of referring back to that bear that would move more at night when we have a lot of human use versus in the day when more humans are using a landscape. And so that temporal displacement and then the length of the temporal displacement is again determines how much of the normal habitat of an animal is no longer available because it's not able to go there for certain parts of the day or certain parts of the week or certain parts of the season depending on what kind of scale of time we're looking at. So what does this look like if we actually put some local data to it? This was a class of 12 students that I had out in Pemberton uh, back in October 2017. So we'd been in the area for about three days, 12 of us camping there and doing some uh, measurements along the trails and trail erosion kinds of measurements. And I left cameras going, we left, we came back in May, and when I looked here, a pack of wolves, this is just one wolf, but I had photos of more, showed up just two days later. So they didn't seem to worry too much about our scent. Um, but how close is that gap? is what really I'm interested in and what, how does it vary by species for how long these detections are apart. Here's another one and so I'll start with me arriving at my camera on May 22nd looking at the last photo on the camera which was taken on May 19th. Around about the same time of day this lovely grizzly bear had been there and it was, so that was on the 19th, this was the 22nd, and just a few days before, he had also been there and around about the same time of day. And so I quickly changed my SD card in this wildlife camera and I quickly got myself out of the way because the expectation is that this bear likely knew I was there and hopefully was happy to leave me alone until I got out of the way. And so this kind of timing, these are photos from wildlife, remote wildlife cameras, which I'll talk about shortly, but I get date and time on each of these, and so I can look at those time dynamics. And then the sort of final piece of literature that I'll share before I sort of tell you how I want to apply this to the Sea to Sky area is about off-leash dogs. And we have a lot of off-leash dogs in our Sea to Sky corridor. The literature suggests that cougars don't like to be in areas with dogs. So they are disturbed by dogs, they are negatively affected by them. And this contributes to a landscape of fear, is language that talks about predation. And if you have an expectation that there's a predator in the area, then your behavior as a prey species is quite different. So again, more vigilance, maybe you're not so eager to, to put your head down and eat. And so we see this kind of reaction to off-leash dogs and to dogs in general. And then, so not only is it just like acting like a predator, but also potential disease, competition. And th these are issues we're seeing on a global basis. So there's literature across the globe about the impacts of dogs. And in many cases, these are um, not your dog out with you on a run, but these are dogs that are more loose and sort of just out in the wilderness um, in general. But there's also literature suggesting that there's disturbances to the for the dogs when we take them out with us as well. So as I mentioned, differences in predator and prey, and so prey species tend to be more attracted to human areas or less disturbed. Predators tend to be more disturbed, and so we end up with this um, predator refuge in areas with much more human use. And this is coming from the Rockies. So when I say prey, I'm talking about moose and elk and white-tailed deer or mule deer. When I say predators, talking about wolves, grizzly bears, cougars, black bears, coyotes. So things that like to eat the prey, the deer type things. So if we are recreating in wildlife habitat, we must, or maybe we have a vested interest in protecting species of concern. 
And so grizzly bears are recovering, but they are still listed. Uh, and so there's a lot of attention spent on potential disturbance to grizzly bears. But it's also important that we keep common species common. And so we have a tendency in the conservation world to focus on species that are, have a decreasing population and whose populations are already so low that actually now we really need to do something for them. If we see them going down already, if we know we are causing disturbance, then there's actually a lot of benefit in managing that issue before we get to having to list a species in terms of species at risk. And then we want to know what size impact we're having, again, to be able to manage it. And then we want to be able to make explicit decisions about what size impact we're willing to accept. Is it okay to displace individuals if there's not a population level effect? So we can think about these things once we understand what size of an effect we might be having. So as I mentioned earlier, there are folks in the Sea to Sky Quarter. Flynnroard uh, is looking at uh, this visiting, visitor use management framework. And so because of all the increase in people and recreational users, um, there's impetus to be able to understand who is using the landscape, how are they using it, what experience are they looking for, what experience are they getting. And we have these frameworks to be able to do this. And so you clarify your purpose. Are we looking to um, exclude or minimize use by visitors? Or are we looking to prioritize areas that allow for more visitors? How do we want to manage the situation? And then define the desired conditions. So what are you looking for? What are the indicators? Identify management strategies and monitoring plans. And then implement management actions and evaluate your effectiveness. So rather than being reactive, there's a goal now to try to get data and then to be able to set up some explicit plans and goals so that we can manage the increase in recreational use and any potential impacts that it could be having. And so this is something that's going on with the government folks right now and trying to kind of draw in these pieces of data. And my work, I'm hoping to, to also contribute to this. So sort of sharing data back and forth to, to help um, build on their objectives and then build on my objectives. So I propose a study and this is a study that I've started already and I'm now trying to build and expand through the Sea to Sky Corridor, uh, the Sea to Sky Mammal Monitoring Project to, ma to monitor recreational impacts on medium to large size mammals. And the blue are kind of my core relevant goals for this, this particular conversation. So to understand the impacts of outdoor recreation on medium to large mammals and to determine the risks for human wildlife encounters, protect, potentially conflict in time and space. The other piece, and Jeanette mentioned I'm interested in land use and climate change impacts, is that we expect some change in the distribution of where animals are over elevational gradients as a result of climate change. This is a long-term expectation as climate change continues to occur. We expect that sort of the mean location of animals is going to go up in elevation. So that's something I'm interested in tracking while also dealing with these more short-term sort of important management kind of questions as well. At the same time, I'm looking to establish a volunteer program whereby I put out wildlife cameras and individuals can actually volunteer with the program to help check uh, the cameras and to get involved with the project to learn more about the issues around recreational management and wildlife. And because I'm at Quest, I'm integrating the project with my teaching. I'm teaching a, a field course in June where students are going to come out and work on this project with me uh, and do some of the data analysis as well. And so ultimately my big question is, how do humans and wildlife overlap in space and time in the Sea to Sky Corridor? And I've put a couple of very general hypotheses, but basically I expect human trail use decreases the abundance of wildlife near trails. Of course this is species specific because in some cases it could increase the use of wildlife near trails. Um, similarly, in time, wildlife will use trails more frequently at night 
or on days when we have lower use. So this could be on weekdays or maybe periods of the year when we have fewer people, so not in that big summer period. And then the encounter risk for humans, I, I imagine it might be highest during the lower use periods. So if wildlife are displacing themselves from human use, and there's a lot of human use, maybe we don't have too much concern for human wildlife encounter because there's, if we're really busy up in that like Joffrey Lakes area, for example. But when we get lower use and sort of on those edges of the season, maybe this is actually when we start getting more wildlife use of the trails and then also those humans have a higher risk of encounter. And so this is something that we'll see more if I can collect some good data to be able to test this kind of a, a question. So the project started in 2017. This is Allie McKellar. She was a student at Quest. And we wanted a site in Pemberton. And so she learned to use a mapping software, which is GIS. It takes the landscape and splits it up into all of these different components so that you can say, I want a place that allows me to drive and not have to walk more than five kilometers after I finish driving. I want a place where I can camp and be within 200 meters of water. I want a place where the slope is less than 40 degrees because that's a safety risk. And so she could narrow down all these locations and she found us this lovely place in Pemberton around the Tenquil Lake trail system in the Tenquil and Owl Lakes recreational area. So we went out and we set up remote wildlife cameras and we did some plant sampling to understand what kind of ecosystem or community of plants were around where these cameras are. And you'll see that I am cutting a tree so that I can put a camera on here, which looks like this. This is a little remotely triggered wildlife camera. And when something moves in front of it, it takes a picture. And in fact, it takes three pictures immediately. And so then that is recorded on an SD card that I can come back and collect whenever I get back out into the field and when the snow is away and I can get access. So wildlife cameras are an increasing, increasingly used tool. They give us these wonderful photos of wildlife, but they also allow us to understand what's happening in the wilderness when we're not there. And I have had these cameras out since 2017, year round, and I go back twice a year to check the batteries and change out the SD cards, and I get a whole year's worth of data out of that, which is pretty fantastic. The tricky part is actually understanding what I can do with those photos to get beyond just the pretty pictures. And so based off having an array, and so this is, you know, I can have a series of cameras out. Right now I have 20 out up in this Tenquil Lake area. And based off whether I get photos of a particular animal on each, on each camera, I can start looking at the time of day, the time of the week, the time of the season, the time of the year that I say get a grizzly bear photo on a camera that's at 1,000 meters. I would expect, based off the of literature, that grizzlies move up in elevation as green up happens. So as the snow melts away and we get those lovely berry bushes coming out, they follow the good food up the side of the mountain. And so I would expect that I would get grizzly photos higher up the mountain later in the year. And I can check that and pay attention to that using this camera array. I can also look at whether they're on the trails or whether they're off trails, because I have cameras on both. And so are they using the trail systems or are they avoiding them? I can also look at how far from the trails do I detect them on my cameras. So I have cameras up to 3,000 meters from trails. Am I only getting grizzlies on those further cameras from the trail? Or do I actually get them all over the place? So I can get a lot of information from that kind of setup. I can also look at frequency of use. Are there certain cameras that get more photos of a particular species? And what is it about that place? Is it because the camera is zoomed in on a huckleberry bush? And we have a lot of things that want to come and eat that kind of stuff. And then once I get a full array of sites, or I have 10 quill right now, and I'm also going to be setting up in the Shannon Basin in Squamish a whole array of cameras. And my goal is to get cameras throughout the whole Sea to Sky region. And so once I have that, then I can start looking at the probability of use of 
particular species in particular places based off the vegetation, based off the climate, based off the elevation, and based off the level of recreational use. So I can put all of these things together to build a model, and using a modeling kind of framework, I can predict other places where I don't have cameras and, and where we might expect animals to be and how they might be behaving there based off the environment of these other places. So this is my Pemberton site. Uh, we've got Tenkill Lake up here, and the trail system kind of comes down and joins up with this, this here, and we get down into the Hurley down along here. And so I set up this grid system because, again, I want more than pretty pictures, so I need to have a sampling design. So this grid system is each square is 500 meters by 500 meters, and then I, these colors represent biogeoclimactic zones. So whether the ecosystem is a coastal western hemlock ecosystem or an Engelmann spruce, so they're, they're usually named for the dominant tree species, so the kinds of vegetation that are in, the pla in each place, or up into more of an alpine ecosystem. And so across these different habitat types, I can start to put out cameras and understand what species are using which places. And so then what I do, I take the GPS coordinates for the very center of a square, and then I get myself on the ground and I try to get to that place. And in some cases, getting to that place is okay, and I can bushwhack for a couple of hundred meters and make myself get there. And in some cases, I realized that that mapping software didn't tell me just how steep the slopes were. And so we have to back off and maybe move a little to, to the next square over. And so the field work and getting this stuff out can be quite, quite fun and adventurous. And so here's the proposed site for Squamish, uh, where again, since the Sea to Sky gondola went in, we've had a huge influx of people in the Shannon Basin and a huge increase in uh, tenure applications for more adventure tourism kinds of of applications. And so now we're, uh, the Flynnroyd is studying who's in here, what are they doing, and what are they up to. And they're using trail counters, whereas I am proposing to use trail cameras. So while they get a hit when anything walks by, I get a photo. And from that, I can look at group size. So who's going out? When are they going out? Are they biking or hiking or trail running? So what kind of activities are happening? And then are they in groups of one or two or 15 or 20? Um, so we, we see that on the trail cameras in Pemberton, that we have these very different kinds of group sizes. And from that, then I can start to piece together where are the wildlife, what are they doing, are they avoiding in space or time? And as I said, my goal is to get multiple sites throughout the Sea to Sky area. And this sort of acronym here, BACI, is before, after, control, impact. What that means, if, if I can go out and monitor what wildlife are doing on a landscape in relation to people, and then a management action goes in to manage that number of people and we see the abundance of those people go down, I can then actually have a lot of power to see if the wildlife respond differently. So those are really wonderful places to get in there and get monitoring before something happens. Also, an expected increase in use. If we start, or BC Parks and the government folks start managing what's happening in Joffrey Lakes, it follows that people who cannot go to Joffrey Lakes on a day will go somewhere else that their two-wheel drive vehicles can take them. So if I can understand where those places might be and start monitoring before that happens, again, we have a lot of power to be able to determine if recreational users are changing the behavior of wildlife and in what ways and, in, and to what extent. So that's my, sorry, that's my dream for the next steps. So ultimately what this looks like is 30 off-trail cameras and 10 trail cameras within a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer study grid. And so again, each of those squares would be 500 meters by 500 meters. And in there I can summarize kind of broad geographic and topographical kinds of variables that would associate to the animals I'm seeing. And as I said, by back zone and then distance from trails, so I can determine if they're spatially avoiding those trails. And so again, looking for black bear, grizzly, wolf, moose, bobcat, deer, these are all the things I'm getting on my cameras already, which have been pretty phenomenal. 
when I first went out with Allie, a really eager and energetic and intelligent student, and I said, okay, we've done all of this work, we've worked these 14-hour days, we've put these cameras out, we may get zero photos. And then we got out there and we got tons of things. And this is Allie, who is a little shorter than me, and I don't know if you can see, but there are grizzly claw marks on this tree all the way down. And so we had a camera nearby here and we didn't get a photo of a grizzly. Um, but clearly there was some activity in this area and so we could record that as well. So on the stat side of things, I'm not going to show you stats, I'm going to tell you all the things I'm going to collect so I can do some stats on this down the road. So across space, right, distance to trail, but we also know that aspect, is it north facing or south facing, does it green up first if it's south facing? What's the elevational change? Where are the, the good foraging areas? All of those things relate to aspect elevation. Date, time, weekend, season, where are the tourists? Where are the wildlife? Uh, the plant phenology, so when do the plants actually green up? That luscious, green, delicious first green up in the spring when things are hungry. And then what's the temperature, precipitation, when do we get snow, how deep is the snow? I can track all of these things to be able to build those statistical models so I can go beyond just the pretty photos on my cameras and say something about nearby locations that I haven't been able to trek across the landscape and put cameras out on. So what I get, this is scary, I'll walk you through it. Um, so these are just different species that I'm getting. These are particular cameras, so some are on trail, some are off. And what we see are the numbers are pretty small. These are the number of photos I get per day. And so I'm not getting a photo of every animal on every camera every day. But again, I'm sampling for a whole year, and so that adds up. But what we see is that the numbers are variable by camera and by species. And so there's a lot of zeros for grizzlies, but I got some grizzlies on this spot. But we see that black bear are just about everywhere. Black bear are immensely abundant in this area. And mule deer also are just about everywhere. Whereas mountain goat, this is a subset, I didn't get on any of these cameras. So I can see that variability and try to use that to understand what's going on. The sampling effort is how long the cameras are out for, so based off my deployment and sometimes when the batteries die, and so sampling effort varies. And then again, I can look at these on-trail and off-trail comparisons to try to understand, are wildlife mostly using trails or are they mostly off in the bush? What, what's happening? I can standardize, so here I've taken those small numbers, that photos per day, and I've multiplied it by the longest effort that I had, 141 days. So it's an estimate, but ultimately it seems to say that black bear, coyote, wolf, and mule deer are using trails more than they are not. And so my photo, I'm getting more sort of a higher photo rate of these animals on the trail cameras than in the off-trail cameras. But it's the opposite for things like grizzly bear, bobcat, cougar, moose, and mountain goat. So not intensely surprising at this point, uh, we know black bear and mule deer use trails. We probably see them when we're out all the time. We probably see them more frequently than we see bobcats and cougars and grizzly bears. So not too surprising at this point, but as I start to build this across all of the sites, I get more information to be able to understand sort of the bigger picture. I also get this really neat visitor use information. And so I can look at, this is just a 64 day period, I can look at the number of people who are hiking and mountain biking for a multi-day packs, and this is a guess based off the size of the pack, versus using day packs. And then across a week, I can start looking at, well, how many users are in this area? This is important information just for managers, regardless of people who are interested in wildlife. And so just again, that visitor use management framework could really use this kind of data to be able to understand what kind of resources we need to be supplying to these areas to be able to support the users. So again, I can look at this by day of the week. I can look at who's going hiking up and who's hiking down. Uh, not many mountain bikers go up in this landscape. It's a heli mountain biking area. And so we see that there's a whole lot of them coming down in comparison. Uh, and so I can look at all different variations. Here is the day-to-day -day variation in one particular series. Blue are hikers, 
And so here we're up to about 26 hikers on this day. And then this is mountain bikers, so about 20 mountain bikers on this day. And I've, the gray bars are the weekends, so I can say, hey, are we more busy on the weekends? And then I can look at a photo. This is a couple of hundred meters from the trail. It's taken on the same day as this group of mountain bikers, 17 mountain bikers, came down that trail. And so I compare those in time and again get a sense of whether these, mount, these mountain bikers may have encountered this bear or had a high risk of encountering, and also whether this, this uh, bear with a cub was maybe disturbed by these mountain bikers. And how many cases do we have where we have these wildlife close to these higher use uh, days or periods, uh, and to what extent are these wildlife potentially disturbed? And so I need to show some pretty pictures because this was a talk about wildlife cameras. Um, as I say, all kinds of black bear photos. And you can see that these are all off trail. And so I hike into the center of one of those grids and then I find the most likely place to be able to detect wildlife, usually open areas, places with a bit of a path going through. This was an old skid road that I put one down on. Here we've just got like a nice open area where the camera can actually capture some photos. Here we get some other great photos. So we've got a deer coming through here. The photos take photos at night as well. Here we get a marmot running across. And you can start to see too the kind of variation in the landscapes that I'm sampling. Here we get um, the glowing eye of a vicious snowshoe hare. We get a lot of photos of those at night. A grouse. And then we get this lovely moose poking his head in. Here, because it's not always really obvious, we have ourselves what I'm pretty sure is a bobcat, kind of tufts of above the ears and a short tail right here. But maybe you'd believe anything I told you. <laughs> and here, we actually have a mountain goat. Here's the horns, and there's the white. So because each trigger gets me three photos, I can actually flick forward and back, and the movement actually allows me to detect the animal in there. So I can actually figure out, what is this thing? And so just sort of another, another marmot here, and a lesson learned that when you deploy a camera in the snow season, it might not be so useful in the no snow season. This is me. <laughs> And so there wasn't a whole lot of chance I was going to detect much more here. And so again, um, there, is an art, there is an art to placing a camera that is going to be useful for this. And then there is a science to figuring out how you might lay them out on the landscape so that you could get more than just pretty pictures or goofy pictures of myself walking up to the camera. So that's all I have at this point because I uh, have just got my 2017 to 2018 data set together and so I'll be doing some wonderful stats uh, soon to be able to look more across that whole annual data set to see where everything was and when. Um, but for now, I'll leave it there and thank these folks. So I'm getting a lot of support from Alistair McCrone, the recreational manager, and folks working on the visitor use framework, um, Susie Dane Owens, and then the uh, Pemberton Wildlife Association, that's an error, have also been highly supportive of this project from the start, which again started as this sort of passion project with, um, and, and an pro undergraduate project with Allie. Uh, and the Pemberton Wildlife Association have been really uh, supportive in, in chatting with me about kind of the core issues, right? We care about recreational users and we care about uh, the grizzly bears and we want to know what's happening on the trails and we so it's been really wonderful to work with them And now the sea to sky gondola is also supporting me expanding into Squamish to be able to start getting data there as well Which is pretty exciting uh, Otherwise all of the folks in these photos have come out and helped collect some data and Christian Aaron kill is my research assistant who's gone through thousands and thousands and thousands of photos to be able to turn those lovely photos into some wonderful Excel spreadsheet data so now I can do the stats on it. So I am happy to take any questions at this point. Thank you. Um, before you want we to, hear oh. questions, if anybody doesn't take
take off at this point. I know it's been a long day. Um, you're welcome to just exit out this way quietly. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, let's let's take it away. Any questions? Question. Yep. Question about cameras. Yes. I think you indicated uh, 40 cameras in a situation there. Yep. The plan. What does a camera cost? Mm -hmm. And could you use more cameras, or would you get them to be? A uh, couple of so. Cameras cost much like anything from a small amount of money to a big, a lot of money, a big amount of money. So the cameras I'm using cost to get the camera, the SD card, and the lock to keep it on the tree so it doesn't walk away with all the recreational users. Um, is they're about three hundred dollars, and so these are cameras. Wildlife cameras have actually, or remote cameras, have come a long way, and so they give pretty good pictures. The research grade and the cameras that came out initially for researchers to use are more in the range of eight to nine hundred dollars. And so I also had Christian go out, Christian Aaron Kill go out to a soccer field and figure out if my field of view on these cameras is as good as those eight hundred dollar cameras and whether the trigger was working as efficiently. And there's been some other studies that have done this. So they seem to work actually as well or better. Uh, I think the difference in value, much like a raincoat, is that the Reconyx cameras, those more expensive cameras, last longer and can handle being buried in snow without having malfunctions more, more frequently. So I had my first malfunction on a camera after two years where it got buried two winters in a row, and so that camera I think now is out of commission. But I've, I've aimed for the cheaper cameras so I can have more. And then the can I have more cameras, yes. And so the number that I put out uh, was first set just by my own capacity. At this point, given sort of what I have, I think I'll, I'll, my next step would be to have a research assistant sort of more full time to be able to expand any further. And then the decision to have each of my areas 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers is also, also needed to be a pretty explicit decision. So, that is a small scale to be sampling wildlife over. A wildlife population for any of the wildlife that I mentioned actually covers a much larger amount of ground. And quite often, wildlife biologists will sample more at a population level. So instead of being this fine scale sampling, they're looking much broader across the landscape. And they get population level information that people like managers who manage the populations really want to know. That tends to be less effective for managing resource use or uh, recreational users and the implications and the impacts we might be having at this smaller scale. So I'm explicitly choosing a smaller scale and want many replicates so that I get a bigger picture across the sea to sky, but I get a detailed picture locally that will help with local management issues. Does that make sense? I could talk for a long time on all of those decisions for sure. Question? Uh, can I do that just by going? I'm going to do it really rough here. Uh, I'll just scroll right back. I also have a card here if you wanted to grab it, but this will also work. Um, yeah, there we go. You're welcome. Question? Yeah, and so I'm certainly not a grizzly biologist, and I've been uh, planning to sit down. I think he's going to know by individual the grizzlies I have on these photos, which is great. Steve Rochetta is the grizzly biologist in the region. My understanding is that the numbers are coming up, and my understanding actually mostly comes from what I've just read in these, these articles about the issue. Um, is that the numbers are increasing, we're seeing a rebound, but we're talking about a couple of individuals. And that folks actually think it's more the fact that we have more people on the landscape to increase that probability of encounter um, that is potentially leading to what we're seeing. So I'm not entirely sure if 
Because it could be that we have more grizzly bears. It could be that they're changing their behavior and their distribution. And it could be that we have more people there to be able to run into them. And likely, it's probably some combination of all of those factors. But I would definitely want to connect more with like Steve Rochetta and some of the grizzly bear biologists who are more familiar with, with exactly what the populations are doing in the region. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we have this, this trail network that's gone into the Alpine, and we have a rec recovering population. So you have this uh, obvious, predictable uh, you know, situation that's occurred. Yeah. So anyway, I had to, had to put my head there. Um, the, but um, so it sounds to me what you're saying is that is, is it your uh, your manpower issue is the main thing that's bringing bringing more cameras, or is it that and a combination of resources for actually? Um, so I guess I'm, it, it's not so much a constraint, it's that I'm sort of building up now to expand from the Tolra location. And so I am fundraising, I'm, I'm a sort of building up to start connecting with some people um, to look for more financial resources. And as part of that, there would be a research assistant built in to, to have more kind of person power to be able to actually get more cameras out on the landscape. I've talked with Alistair quite a bit, and so he's got uh, quite a sense of kind of these core ideas, so he knows where they're planning to do some management. So we talked about the Squamish Valley uh, and putting in some new management planning in there, and so you can actually uh, monitor the before and after to get uh, a sense of whether the management is doing anything with respect to wildlife behavioral change. Uh, and then we talked about some likely areas where the Joffrey overflow might end up being, and I'd really like to get into some of those, those sites. Uh, and then, you know, places that are already really busy and are already causing, ha like where we've already got some of these conflicts. So I had uh, applied for some money actually to go to the Rainbow Lake region, um, but I didn't end up getting that funding from, it was a bigger granting agency. Um, and so I didn't get that, that was planned to be uh, deployed for next year. And so I didn't get that at that time. And so there's a, a, a list of places, and then the trade-offs. I, I need to explicitly look at the trade-offs. And again, if I'm getting local funding for this, it would depend on where the funding is coming from. So the sort of the beauty of the small-scale local approach is, you know, in Pemberton, the Pemberton Wildlife Association are interested in that part, but they're not so concerned about Squamish. And in Squamish, you know, the Sea to Sky gondola wants to know what's happening there, but they don't care that I'm up in Pemberton. I care because collectively I get a bigger data set and I can ask some bigger questions. But for the local issue, it will depend on where the funding comes and what the local sort of priorities are. And I think for, yeah, for my purposes, there's a lot of places that can work effectively for the bigger project. Uh, I would want to put down a whole budget, but, uh, but the, the site I'm looking at being between about 25 to 30,000 for each sort of 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer site. And so what I'm trying to do is build a, a, like a proposal and a funding package so I can go to, you know, maybe folks who are interested in Rainbow, Rainbow Lake and say, here's what I would be looking at to set up this 30, 30 cameras off trail, 10 cameras on trail um, program, and here's what that money will be used for. So somewhere in a roundabout there. How many years does that get? That's just to set it up. So that's the cameras, uh, some labor, uh, to be able to, sort of the biggest labor once, I mean the cameras, you do a lot of hard work to get them out, but then the biggest labor is actually going through all the photos to record the data. And there's some automated programs that allow for that, but the data you get out 
sometimes is not uh, quite as detailed as what I might like to be able to look at things like group size and demographics of users and that sort of temporal, small temporal scale. So um, yeah, so that's your setup for a year. And then the second year, if you, do, you replace some cameras, but then the price will go down because you're not purchasing all the cameras. Yep. Anything else? Jeanette? Oh, um, it's a loaded question, I know. <laughs> so it's so hard, to, like coming up with examples on the fly. I will say, what's that? Yeah, so, yeah, so Keyhole Hot Springs, right? Um, and so we do have, or that was probably more even to protect the people, and I guess also the black bears. Um, sometimes we need to be protected from ourselves. Uh, you know, there's, there's been all sorts of socioeconomic impact due to spotted owls in the northwest of the U.S. Um, and that's not a recreational issue per se, that, that was actually more about forestry and spotted owls, right? So, but conservation issues can certainly lead to us not being able to do the kinds of things we want to do on the landscape. And if you look at the kind of history down in the U.S. and the ability to go and use their national parks is quite more restricted than our ability to use our, our national parks, right? And so as you get more demands on the landscape for multiple different kinds of users, there do tend to be more restrictions in how we might go about that, right? And I, I think in the Sea to Sky region, we're sort of at that place where we're not used to being managed where we go and when and what we can do there, right? We can still pull over on the side of the road and park wherever we want for the most part. Uh, and so I think, you know, that becomes more of a social science co conversation. Um, and then the opposing values of we want to use our wilderness, but when we do that, we're having an impact on it, so we can't use it anymore. And the fact that we are a place driven by the desire for people to enjoy the wilderness and our environment, we need to protect it, but people also need to use it. So, so this is where that visitor use management framework comes in and understanding kind of what are the core issues, who are the core users, what kind of experience are they expecting, what are sort of the value endpoints, wildlife, humans, tourism, economics, management, all of these, and, and which ones do we prioritize where? So yes, there are, there are some examples. Have you looked at any sites for zero volume products that are trying to use the country right Yes, uh, so I'm hoping to apply for money with them in February as their next funding cycle. I would love to get two sites up there. I'm not sure, so I had a student uh, who was looking at just at trail, um, vegetation and impacts of trails close to trails from mountain bike and hiking trails. And he went up into Elfin and also went up into Taylor Meadows. Um, and so those are two places where I know we have high user numbers, uh, but I would be pretty interested in talking with parks themselves because they would know more sort of the dynamics of users across the BC parks in the region. Uh, and so uh, I'm gonna apply next year and hope to, to have some success there. I do think there's some interest um, Ali McKellar, who started this project with me, has been working with BC Parks as well, and so uh, she's certainly still a champion and involved with the project. Question? What you said when I apologize, but the two of you were sharing this information for what goal? I didn't say it, and I love that question. Um, so I... I'm a researcher who is interested in writing scientific papers and getting sort of the big picture, but I'm not at a research university where I require that for my job, which is lovely. I'm, I, I'm required to teach. Uh, and so to me, that means everything I do should be useful to somebody immediately before I get a paper written in three years or something. And so I've started this, as I say, I've been talking with the Pemberton Wildlife Association in the beginning when we started this to ask what their priorities were and what was really important for them. And, they, and so we've had some great conversations there. And so I'm sharing my data with them already. 
I had been talking with Alistair McCrone, who's the recreation manager, to find out what are their priorities. And then I talked with the Squamish, or with the Sea to Sky Gondola to find out their priorities. So my interest is in maintaining the scientific quality of it and that specific sampling regime that gives me the power to put all of the pieces together, but that they are locally useful from a management perspective as soon as I get the data out. And so we've already, you know, I've already shed some light on what the user numbers are like on the Tenka Lake Trail. And, and you know, that was informative, right? And so I, I want as much value to come from this data and I'm open to sharing it as widely as there is interest in having use from it. To what end? To what end? Yeah. Oh, so that we can minimize our impact on wildlife. And so it's possible that this is going to tell us that actually we're not having any, any really negative impacts. And that would be wonderful, right? Um, maybe it's the most valuable thing that comes out of it is realizing that uh, folks need to provide more resources for all of these users on the landscape. And hey, did you know that mountain bikers are using this place more than hikers? Maybe we, you need to target it there. I can share that data. I probably won't be part of that conversation. That's part of that visitor use framework. And so I'll feed into it, but certainly I'm not the decision maker. And so my end is to find out the information because right now we don't know. It's a knowledge gap. We have expectations. We think there may be problems, but we still don't know. And I think when we expect there to be problems and we don't have the information, all of these users competing for the landscape can start uh, there can be conflicts that arise that having some more information can maybe allow us to have a more productive conversation. So you're worried that if there is significant impact that no one's going to claim for that? I mean, Chalker is a great example because it's turned into a zoo. Yeah. It's, it's pretty thin and slow, but it's, not, it's been a fast process, but maybe it should have been shut down four years ago as opposed to three years ago. But right. Yeah, so this, I was, a, I was an environmental consultant for three years, and I teach about climate change and biodiversity loss, and so I tend to not feel the sort of depressed mood at the end of the class that my students feel, and so I'm somewhat resilient to the way the world works. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't think change happens quickly. I don't think presenting the numbers means everybody's going to say, oh, we must stop doing this. I, I, I don't expect that. What I expect is that it becomes part of the conversation and it becomes public. And then a public, I think, has a lot of power, particularly in these kinds of places where we live. Um, I think organizations, particularly if I've, I'm working with organizations like the PWA or other NGOs or other regional uh, groups, that they have a voice. And so I, my, what's important to me is sharing clear and useful information and then gently prodding the conversation toward using it for effective management. So I'm not an activist. But I very much appreciate sitting at the table and talking about the very complex multi-user framework that really most of these issues get resolved in, or at least decisions get made in. I mean, I, I am from Newfoundland. Let's go to Newfoundland. <laughs> her watered in lakes. Let's go to all the most like, the beautiful places. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we need more effective monitoring on very large scales. Uh, the, my capacity couldn't take me there right now. Um, but what is happening with these camera, using these cameras, is that people are trying to standardize the data they pull out of it. And there are folks, Cole Burton at UBC is one of these folks in here, who are trying to network all of the people who are using wildlife cameras so that my small scale might link into some other, somebody else's larger scale, might link into you know, what's happening maybe in Riding Mountain. Um, Alberta, there's a, a lot of use of wildlife cameras. That's where I did my PhD, so I'm connected with that community. 
uh, and consultants use a lot of cameras there. So there's potential with this tool, if used effectively, to give us much bigger and broader scale kinds of information. And it, it requires, again, as I say, I want to work with local folks who, who have a use for this data right now, but it also requires me to connect with Cole Burton, which I'm doing, um, and then, you know, to connect into that network so that all of those conversations keep happen happening. So we have more capacity to do more stuff and to learn more about what's happening because it's not just recreational users, right? We already know roads have a huge effect. Land use, forestry, you know, the run of the river projects, all of this other activity is a much broader scale kind of issue, but it is also having an impact on our wildlife. And so when we understand what's happening with recreational users, we then need to put that into more of the context of the cumulative effects. And then also the fact that climate change is having an impact on all of the species and the vegetation and the ecosystems. And cumulative effects often get separated from climate change, but they absolutely need to be connected because they are all of the things that are impacting species. So yeah, it's about a lot of conversations rather than me being the person on the ground around riding mountain all the time. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you. Thanks. Am I still on? You are still on, I think. Still on, I think. Can I turn this off? <laughs>